Good evening. This April 12, 2018 regular meeting of the Fairfax County School Board will now come to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, a moment of silence, and the performance of the national anthem by the Spring Hill Elementary School Band under the direction of Dan Freeman. I pledge allegiance I pledge to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, Thank you very much, Spring Hill students. That was excellent. We want to thank the Spring Hill parents for sharing your children with us tonight. And is uh, Mr. Olk here, our principal? Thank you all very much, Spring Hill. It was outstanding. In order to comply with section 2.2-3712D of the Code of Virginia, it is necessary for the board to certify that since the Fairfax County School Board convened a closed meeting on April 12, 2018, to the best of each member's knowledge, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements and only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered by the board during the closed meeting. Is there a motion? Moved by Mr. Moon, seconded by Ms. Hines. All those in favor? Ah, that motion is unanimous. Thank you very much. A few announcements before we begin tonight's meeting. Uh, Ms. Palchuk will be absent this evening. If you would like to review a copy of the agenda in any agenda item that is being discussed tonight, that information is on the table by the auditorium entrance. Tonight's agenda is available by going to School Board on the FCPS homepage and selecting Board Docs under Upcoming School Board Meetings. The meeting is also being streamed live online. Select School Board from the full menu, then click on the Watch Live button on the School Board Meetings webpage. Please turn off or silence your cell phone. 
I will now call on Ms. Fetaconda for announcements. Thank you, Madam Chair. April 15th to 21st is National Volunteer Week. Established in 1974, National Volunteer Week has grown exponentially in scope each year since, drawing the support and endorsement of all subsequent U.S. presidents, governors, mayors, and other respected elected officials. National Volunteer Week is about inspiring, recognizing, and encouraging people to seek out imaginative ways to engage in their communities. It's about demonstrating to the nation that by working together in unison, we have the fortitude to meet our challenges and accomplish our goals. National Volunteer Week is about taking action, encouraging individuals and their respective communities to be at the center of social change, discovering and actively demonstrating their collective power to foster positive transformation. During the 2016 to 2017 school year, 183 schools, centers, and alternative high schools reported that 68,076 volunteers donated 650,271 hours of volunteer service to FCPS schools. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all the wonderful volunteers who help us every day. <laughs> we couldn't do it without them. This month is the Military Child Recognition Month, very important here in Fairfax County, and I will call on Mrs. Schultz to read a recognition. We are so honored to have with us this evening several very special guests. FCPS and the Fort Belvoir Military Installation have had a long-standing relationship founded on behalf of students, families, the Fairfax and Fort Belvoir communities, representing Lieutenant Colonel Christopher Tomlinson, the Fort Belvoir Garrison Commander, is Lieutenant Colonel James Matheson, Fort Belvoir Headquarters Battalion Commander. Also from Fort Belvoir, we have school liaison officers Jamie Albers and E. Wendy O'Sullivan. April is the month of military child, which I'm one. It is a time to recognize our military and veteran-connected students for their service and sacrifice. Here in Fairfax County, we are extremely fortunate to have 8,066 students who are part of military families as well as part of our Fairfax County Public Schools family. Being part of a military family brings rich life experiences and opportunities not afforded civilian peers. Our military-connected youth are engaged in their school and community, report healthy peer relationships, and are resilient and patriotic. Being military connected also brings frequent moves, often every one to three years, multiple parental deployments, resulting in family separation and other challenging life transitions. Some of our FCPS students shared their stories of, military, of being military connected, hoping to increase educator and community awareness of the life of a military connected youth. Tonight, we welcome three of the students from our video library. Just, Justin Grinkowicz and his parents, General and Mrs. Grinkowicz, Meredith Martinez and her family, parents Master Sergeant and Mrs. Martinez and Sister Kaylee, also a student in FCPS. Also here tonight is Stephen King and his father, Gunnery Sergeant King. Stephen will be featured in a video we will share with everyone shortly. Additionally, we welcome members of the Military Connected Youth Process Action Team who work on behalf of our Military Connected Youth. Celebrating the month of the military child provides a powerful opportunity to raise awareness and build support to help these children meet the unique challenges they face. It is an opportunity to recognize and thank military children and youth for their heroism, character, courage, sacrifices, and continued resilience. Part of the celebration of military youth is wearing the color purple. If you blend all together of the military branches, they combine to the color purple. Tomorrow, April 13th, is Purple Up for Military Kids Day, and we invite everyone to wear purple to show your support and to thank military youth for their strength and sacrifices. Would the students and families please stand and be recognized?
Our special guests are here this evening to join with the board and recognize the month of the military child and to thank these special students and their families for their service to our great nation. We have a short video featuring Stephen King, one of our many military students. I'd like us to invite to play the video, but I have to say I watched every single video. It was very difficult picking which one um, we would display tonight, but um, of all of them, I thought this would most best share the experience um, of a child in a military family. April is the month of the military child. Hello, my name is Steven. My dad is a Master Sergeant in the Marine Corps. The benefits of having a parent in the military is having a, someone who is loving and caring and is also willing to put their lives on the line to protect you. We've moved about eight or nine times. My dad moved uh, by himself two of those times. So we moved, we've gone around, we've been in 29 Palms in Florida. Um, majority of the time he was stationed in New Orleans, but we've also been in Beaufort, South Carolina, in Jacksonville, Florida, and now we're up here in D.C. When I, when I leave my current school to go to a new school, I'm not really too much worried about the school situation. It's leaving the friends is what really hurts. It's when, you, when you have to leave your friends behind, that's what's really sad about it, and that's what makes it so harder, so much harder than if you were to just stay in one spot. Um, when you do move, though, if, as long as you stay in contact, you, it does make it feel like you have friends all over the world. My dad, he's, he's a big loving guy. He's kind of like that, those giant teddy bears that you get. He's tall, I mean, he's big, I mean, you can't miss him. Um, he, and, he, and he's really athletic, so he loves to do stuff that we all do. And the hardest part about my father being deployed is he's not there to see what I can do or what I am doing. For the longest time my dad has been away from us, that I remember at least, his, was three years. And that was during my middle school years. Um, this, this, some of the events that he missed, like my football games and everything, it was sad knowing that he wasn't there, but my mom would take video. And so we would talk by phone or camera or FaceTime or whatever. And so we would talk about it and he would say good job and whatnot. So. It was pretty rough not having them there, but being able to communicate with them through phone or um, FaceTime is helpful. In my household, when my dad deploys, I have to take on more responsibility to take care of my little sister. So, uh, and when we were in New Orleans, my mom would have to work more because she was a police officer, so she would have to do overtime or whatnot. So taking on the responsibility of having a younger sibling is what really changed. So it changed your mentality about being around who you, around people that you know and stuff. There's a rush of happiness. You, you can't contain yourself when you finally see him again. Um, you kind of, sometimes you'll even, I, sometimes I even break down and cry. So, I mean, it's, it's a real rush when he comes back, even though you knew he was coming back. Um, being in the military and what I would like other students and teachers and people to know is that during some points in time, especially if you know that our family member just got deployed or whatnot, like, take it easy on us a little bit. I mean, it, it's kind of hard not having someone around that you're used to having around. The benefits of being in the military, you may be moving away from friends, but as you move away, you also move to somewhere to where you can make more friends. And so you know people all over whatever country you're in or wherever, so you get to know people. If you move out of the country, you get to know people in a different country now. So if you're ever in there, I mean, you have a place to stay maybe, if you get that close with them. I mean, there's all kinds of benefits to being in the military, but that's one of the main ones. The military has made me a better person in treating others who normally people might not want to hang out with just because of how they look, because I've been in that place a time or two. So because I know what they might be going through, it's helped me to deal with other people that may not look like someone cool, but are actually pretty cool people, and it's helped me be a more responsible person. I'm military and I'm FCPS. I just want to say, um, as a uh, daughter, the oldest daughter of um, a career naval uh, surface warfare officer when I was 21, I had 21 moves. 
uh, and that included um, house to house uh, and cross country. I moved my mother across the country twice while my father was deployed when she was eight months pregnant both times. And so I really do understand um, and have walked in the shoes of our military and our military connected youth. And, and we're very proud to have you here and we're proud to serve you. So if we can have um, uh, all of you come up this evening, um, all of our special invited guests, we'd like to take a picture with you um, at the dais with the board. So come on up. I'd also like to mention that Jamie Meyer, who is the acting principal of Fort Belvoir Elementary School is also here, thank you. Chairman Strauss, I just want to also recognize that Carol Padgett, principal of Fort Belvoir Upper, was here along with Jamie Meyer, the acting principal of uh, Fort Belvoir Primary, and we thank our principals for coming. And uh, FCPS really is indebted to the military and their sacrifice and service. And um, I'm, I'm personally touched. That's one of the most powerful videos I have ever seen a Fairfax County young man do or woman do, and it's just a tremendous tribute to this school system in this country. So there's a lot of good going on in our young people and we should be really proud of, of every one of our military children. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Brabrand. Next, uh, I will call on Ms. Darren Kofix. This is National Library Week and School Library Month recognition. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
And as we observe National Library Week and School Library Month, I am thrilled to have heard about an honor that was bestowed to one of our high schools. And I want to congratulate Lee High School for being, <laughs> yes. Lee High School was named the 2018 National School Library Program of the Year by the American Association of School Librarians. And this is the highest national honor for any school library program. So I think that's another round of applause. This award honors library programs that empower their students and staff to be effective users of ideas and information in a constantly changing school and library environment. Lee High School has demonstrated commitment to the association's learning standards and program guidelines and have successfully implemented their program fully into the school's curriculum through strong leadership and community engagement. One outstanding example is the recent school-wide Hour of Code event offered in multiple languages, providing open access to the computer science introduction. Students and staff also came together recently to read Congressman John Lewis's civil rights memoir, March. The librarians led book discussions, helped teachers develop lessons, and created supporting video and art to enhance participation. This award, the award committee described Lee's program best in one word, engaging. Literacy efforts are infused into every corner of the school. So congratulations to Lee High School and co-librarians Mimi Marquette and Lisa Koch for creating, for creating effective thinkers, readers, and researchers with their innovative ideas and programs. Lee High School will receive $10,000 toward its school library program and will be honored in June at the American Library Association Annual Conference in New Orleans. So congratulations. And now on to our recognition of National School Library Week. It is the, a national observance sponsored by the American Library Association and libraries across the country each April. It is a time to celebrate the contributions of our FCPS librarians and libraries. This year, National Library Week will be observed April 8th through the 14th with the theme, Libraries Lead. FCPS librarians design library programs that lead the way in leveling the playing field for all students who seek information and access to technologies. FCPS librarians are leaders in their schools, in their communities, and in the nation. School Library Month is the American Association of School Librarians celebration of school librarians and their programs. Strong school library programs play an essential role in the student's educational career, and FCPS school librarians are dedicated to meeting the needs of every student through literacy development and relevant inquiry-based instruction that fosters curiosity, innovation, and ensures students meet the portrait of a graduate outcomes. The school board welcomes this opportunity to commend Fairfax County Public Schools librarian and to express our gratitude for the energy, knowledge, and vision they provide the school system. So thank you so much, and I would like to invite all of the librarians who are here today to join me and my colleagues for a photo.
This is Autism Awareness Month recognition, and I call on Mrs. Schultz for another recognition. So Autism Awareness Month is celebrated every year in April to provide an opportunity for families, friends, and local communities to raise awareness and acceptance of autism and the unique aspects and talents of all people. Autism is a complex developmental disability that affects an individual's social interaction and communication skills. It is known as a spectrum disorder because each child is different and is affected in unique ways with many strengths and challenges. Students with autism attend many of our schools in Fairfax County and grow up to make meaningful contributions to the community. Before I invite you all up, I just wanna say that to the teachers, to the administrators, the counselors, the school psychologists, um, who spend all the time with these families and your IEP meetings and your IEP addendums and all of the supports that happen in school and in the community. Um, as a, a parent of children with special education needs, while not with autism, um, I know how much you dedicate and try to help um, incorporate these children to have meaningful, successful academic and social emotional experiences in our, in our schools, and I'm very, very grateful. Um, at this time, I would like to invite staff from the Office of Special Education Instruction to join me and my colleagues at the dais for a photo. Thank you very much. The next order of business is citizen participation. Tonight, 10 citizens have signed up to address the board. Speakers are requested to limit their remarks to not more than three minutes. The school board will not hear statements involving issues that have been scheduled for public hearings, such as capital improvement program, budget, and boundaries. Complaints regarding individual students or school-based employees should be directed to the appropriate school principal or other school official. Speakers should refrain from using personally identifiable information in connection with an individual student. Speakers are expected to deliver their remarks, comments with a decorum and respect appropriate to the conduct of the public's business. Please be mindful that there are often young children in attendance at these meetings or watching at home. 
so language should be appropriate for all age levels. Thank you for your cooperation and thanks to those who have come to speak to us tonight. Our first speaker is Ekaterina Forkin. Good evening, my name is Ekaterina Forkin and I'm a senior at Oakton High School. Last year for my capstone project, I decided to research the effectiveness of using standardized tests as measurements of student success. I'm speaking here today to provide some insight on the benefits of some slight changes in the county and testing culture that we currently have. To start, FCPS students deal with two distinct types of standardized tests, those mandated by the schools or the state and those required for college applications. A student who earns top marks in school may struggle to earn an average More. score on a standardized test whether it falls under either of the two categories. Pressures on school administration have created a widespread, a widespread technique of teaching the to the test that is not unique to FCPS, in which teachers instruct students how to perform well on tests rather than working on critical skills. State programs such as the SOLs tend to hold back teachers and students accountable for obtaining satisfactory scores. Moreover, a trend observed in the past several years has shown that test scores rise while true learning falls when schools drill students to excel at standardized tests. Factors such as socioeconomic status and previous educational background are often not considered when evaluating individuals on their scores, and this inevitably creates unfair advantages for some students and disputes the effectiveness of using these tests as measures of education. Standardized tests are still used today because they were created with the goal of being objective and comprehensive in nature. In a world where grades and GPA inflation is rife, these tests can offer a level playing field in the admissions process. It is common consensus that grading systems and course rigor vary substantially across schools, so standardized tests can act as regulated factors in ranking student performance, whether at the elementary level or in college applications. Yet, there are many individuals, students, parents, and educators who believe standardized tests are in an un inherently unfair gauge of student performance because widespread testing penalizes diversity and ignores the apparent opportunity gap among students. Standardized tests cannot predict how well a student will flourish in a collaborative environment, participate in seminars, or present an oral project, which are all key components of education and college courses. But a student's GPA can because these types of assessments are included in a student's grade in multiple classes. Grades are not det determined by a singular test. They are a reflection of daily dedication to academia. In fact, 92% of surveyed public high school teachers believe that grades are the best indicator of student engagement and accomplishment. Even when standardized test scores present only a fraction of academic success, they are viewed as a full scope of a student's achievement. So I understand that you're not the college board, but I believe something we can work on in the te is the testing culture we have in FCBS. I believe one thing that would bring about immense change is putting a cap on the number of, a of AP courses a high schooler may take. There's no reason for someone to take five or six AP courses. I did it last year, I did it this year, I know many friends who have done it. It's an insane amount of work and stress, and yet counselors are repeatedly allowed to approve such, such schedules. A cap would decrease the amount of fours and fives that a student has to stress over because this, this is ultimate ultimately the marker of a student's knowledge of a particular course. I also suggest creating a standard grading system that all schools in the county will use. This is one reason that standardized tests are so popular. So I hope that I have provided some insight on the downfalls of using these tests as measurements of student success, and I know that it will take some time to implement some, some change, but I believe the shift will be 100% worth it for our students, teachers, and school administration. Thank you. Thank you. We so enjoy having students come and speak to us. Thank you very much. Next speaker is Keith Fox. Yes, uh, good evening. Uh, my name is Keith Fox. Um, I'm a 20 year resident of Springfield, residing in the Terra Grande neighborhood. I have one recent graduate and have another child graduating this June from Lee High School which was recently recognized as having the National School Library Program of the Year. Thank you for mentioning that. Um, surprisingly, I didn't hear, I didn't see anybody tweet that yet, so I'm looking for the tweet. Um, yeah, thank you. I'm here tonight to raise concerns regarding student goals in Fairfax County Public Schools. Which student goals are we interested in? I understand in the next few weeks, the superintendent will decide whether to make another administrative boundary adjustment that moves 
more wealthier students out of Lee High School into West Springfield High School. This will be the second time that this has happened in three years that this demographic has occurred. Is this segregation? Is this becoming a civil rights issue? Is this gerrymandering? Will some families' wealth increase by this change while mine decreases? Let me explain more about my pain. We have school goals also. I served on the lead PTSA for two years, then volunteered another two years. I mentor, I tutor, I collaborate with the principal. This is one action will work against all of my efforts to rebuild and rebrand our Lee community. There are many parents working purposefully to maintain the high standards at Lee. When you remove communities like Rolling Valley, Daventry from our pyramid, it's a snowball effect on all of our goals. It affects parent volunteers, our PTSA, it affects our fundraisers, our offering of language courses, our AP courses, our IB courses. It changes our demographics. It affects sports programs, average SAT scores. I can go on and on and on, but you already know this. I'm sure you've already seen the stats of the transfers out of Lee in schools like Lee. I don't need to bore you with that. The data is all there. Through FOIA requests and other means, there have been some passionate, committed parents, I'm, I know they're here, who have delivered the facts to you. I've seen some of you. Some are giving up the fight right now, though. They feel like the school board doesn't care. They feel like Fairfax County watched this happen and doesn't care. Some are losing hope. Will you as the school board be a part of the decline of one school while another benefits? Will you support our school's goals for resurgence? Are you with me or against me? Do you care? Fight with the underdog, not against him. I'm gonna leave you with this. This one action will work against all of my efforts to rebuild and rebrand the Lee community. I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next speaker is Robert Rigby. Good evening. My name is Robert Rigby. I'm a 19-year veteran teacher in FCPS. Student success means success for all students, including transgender students. I went to a conference at the Department of Education in D.C. last week, where they honored people with the Martin Luther King Jr. Drum Major Award for Faith-Based Initiatives. It made sense to me that they called it faith-based rather than church-centered. The language was inclusive of religious minorities without excluding the majority. We need to use similar language when we talk about transgender people. We don't want to erase anyone. A truth about many transgender people is that they have transitioned genders at some point. How do we talk about this? We certainly don't refer to their real sex. Their real sex is the sex with which they identify, and neurological science, genetic science, and people's lived experiences say that the sex or gender that transgender people express is their real sex. Unfortunately, the phrase, phrases biological sex, physiological sex, and anatomical sex are used as stand-ins for real sex and go just as far to deny the truth of gender identity. That is the language that the Gloucester County School Board has used to separate Gavin Grimm from other boys in that famous case. And it is the language that the Trump administration uses to deny the possibility of military service in our armed forces to transgender soldiers. It also denies the existence of intersex people. So what language do we use to include the minority without excluding the majority? The medical and legal experts have come up with what I would call best practices in this discussion, the phrase sex assigned at birth. That takes a little explanation, but anything worth talking about can withstand explanation. So here goes. When a child is born, the doctor makes a visual inspection of their external anatomy and says that they are male, female, or intersex. Then the doctor puts that on the birth certificate. Thus we get the phrase, sex assigned at birth. 
For most people, this matches their gender identity. In other words, their gender matches their external and anatomical or physical appearances at birth. But for some people, their sex assigned at birth does not match their gender identity. So we can use words such as sex assigned at birth to refer to people and explain it in terms of external or anatomical appearance at birth. We can avoid words such as biological sex, physiological sex, and anatomical sex. Thus, we include the minority without erasing the Yes, include the minority without erasing the majority. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Liz Murphy. Good evening I, uh, to Dr. Braybrand and the school board. Uh, I am a parent of two recently high school graduates and I direct my questions to the school board tonight regarding the second in three years proposed adjustment to boundaries of Lehigh School. What visible and concrete steps will you as a full board take to assure that Lehigh School, if this action is taken, will, and I quote from policy 8130.7, maintain or improve instructional effectiveness of, of Lehigh School? Note that Daventry, when the four-year boundary phase-in is complete, will send approximately 110 students to West Springfield. This is about 6.2% of Lee's current enrollment, exceeding the 5% projected and used percentage to justify the move in 2015. Breaking the Daventry and Rolling Valley Valley administrative boundary requests into two separate decisions only three years apart has hijacked you as the school board's role in making this decision. These two decisions will result in a net loss of 10% loss to the Lee High School community. Will this school board consider that a reasonable thing to do? The FCPS capital improvement plan projects that West Springfield will be at 105 capacity by 2023. Moving Rolling Valley to students to West Springfield will push that number to approximately 108%, while Lee may go as low as 82%. Where is the equity in the, in the quality of education for Lee High School? Lee High School has an active group of parents who have been trying hard to strengthen Lee High School. These efforts have not been visible to Lee High School and to its neighborhoods. Moving these higher socioeconomic neighborhoods, Hunt Valley in 2005, Daventry in 2015, and then potentially Rolling Valley just three years later in 2018 will make Lee High School much weaker and of course will strengthen West Springfield by allowing it to have more electives and different classes. How can the school board justify these decisions which have a very significant impact on the overall academic health of Lee High School? I remind you also that all of the feeder schools of Lee High School are Title I, where there is not one elementary school feeding into West Springfield that is designated as Title I. Regulation 8130.9 states the division superintendent may reconsider an adjustment that previously did not meet the above criteria if it evaluations by staff indicates that there has been a significant change in the adjustment's impact or determining factors. Will the school board ask Superintendent Braybrand to reconsider and reverse the Daventry boundary decision? And will also the school board complete the boundary study that was not done in 2005, which should have studied the Lee, Lake Braddock, and West Springfield pyramids? We thank you for your time and your attention to this, and we await your decisions. Thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Norman Hall. Good evening, Chairman Strauss, members of the school board, Dr. Braybrand. My name is Norm Hall. I'm here tonight to speak about the student success element of the FCPS strategic plan. I want to begin by mentioning that the Fairfax County Special Education PTA, for whom I serve as advocacy chair, has already voiced concerns about student success in multiple voices and multiple formats. 
I, among others, have testified in favor of full FCPS funding before the County Board of Supervisors in anticipation of a cooperative approach to our concerns and solutions. Last night, SEPTA listened along with Dr. Braybrand and members of the Advisory Committee on Students with Disabilities as parents of FCPS students drew upon their experiences as to the varying degrees to which our students' needs are met. We have confidence in our system to do well. As we anticipate the successful growth and development of our students into maturity, so do we hope to see FCPS become the premier school system for consistency and accountability in educating students with disabilities. To that end, SEPTA is ready to extend whatever assistance we can. On October 12th, SEPTA President Diane Cooper Gould testified at the embedded public hearing about the comprehensive plan, pointing out its limitations with respect to a lack of specific planning to address the needs of students with disabilities. On November 20th, I spoke during citizen time in support of the One Fairfax policy and similarly pointed out the gap between the reality and the promise, which appears in the accountability framework section of the policy. I quote, Fairfax County government and Fairfax County public schools will incorporate data and publish performance measures that can be analyzed, quantified, and disaggregated to evaluate the extent to which our systems are achieving goals identified through the racial and social equity action plan. Between our appearances to this school board, SEPTA published a position statement regarding the FCPS strategic plan and strategic plan update. Ideally, almost six months later, consideration of the student success element of the strategic plan tonight should show in a clear and meaningful way how students with disabilities will fit in to present work plans in light of SEPTA's official positions. I'm going to quote from them for the rest of my time. SEPTA believes that the development of specific and measurable plans to improve outcomes for students with disabilities is necessary due to the inequity of performance and the individualized nature of special education. And we stand ready to support FCPS in this effort. To that end, we recommend that the strategic plan be updated to offer detailed activities and initiatives specifically designed. SEPTA has a growing concern for the special education teachers and staff supporting our students in special education. The reality of a high turnover rate and increasing caseloads is a serious issue. And with regard to turnover rate, a drastic discrepancy from the tenure of general education teachers. Finally, SEPTA believes that metrics beyond graduation rates and SOL pass rates are needed to accurately measure successful performance for students in special education. SEPTA believes that all children in FCPS would benefit from a notion of success measured in a more holistic approach to include data collection of social emotional growth, life skills, positive behavior changes, and other academic criteria beyond SOL pass rates. Without a clear understanding of what it means to be a successful special education student, FCPS cannot accurately evaluate and make decisions regarding the efficacy of special education programs. I thank you. Thank you. The next speaker is Amanda Brewer. Hello, I'm Amanda Brewer and I have, a I have children in a couple schools in FCPS. Student success means success for children in military families who are being recognized tonight in the resolution of the month of the military child. As a military family, I would love for all children to succeed in FCPS. For my family, this means protections for LGBT kids. We wanted to come to this area, and we felt blessed to have our children in one of the best districts in the nation. We knew there would also be wonderful medical care here too, and that was a big priority for us as one of our children has a heart condition. What we didn't know at the time was we needed LGBT protections. I started off as many families not knowing what I didn't know, and then my child came out, and that's when we noticed the inconsistencies between schools. A year later, in a very late meeting, you guys changed that. You created a non-discrimination policy that included gender identity and sexual orientation. The issue is you left out the guidance on how to move forward with the policy. Each school has the ability to decide on their own way to implement this. This means one military family at one school can have a vastly different experience 
than a family a few miles over. Our own elementary school has had six principals in seven years. This means the school could change a lot with the decisions of the upcoming principal in the next few weeks. Military, military children are moving into the area right now as it's known as PCS season. These families may get very lucky at their school or not. There are still children who don't have access to bathrooms or only one bathroom in the whole school that they can use. Different or separate arrangements unfortunately points out LGBT students. This can be easily fixed by issuing guidance. This means the district and schools are on the same page and all families know exactly where the district stands. Military families coming into the area will know what to expect all around. They won't have to rely on social media or hearsay to pick a good place to live. Each school will do the same thing and all kids, not just most, will be protected. We haven't had an easy seven years here, but we don't deny that we haven't been blessed to live in this area. We believe you can and will do what's best for the children. Please consider it sooner rather than later. Thank you. The next speaker is Rock Neheiser. I have copies of my remark. I can leave with the clerk afterwards. There we go. Thank you. Hello, and thank you for the opportunity to speak. I am the parent of two children who are products of Fairfax County Public Schools, a class of 2017 graduate and a freshman with autism at Lake Braddock Secondary School. I am here to speak to you about your student success and your overarching goals that FCPS will present to you tonight to implement strategic goal number one. I understand there are four overarching strategies. I'd like to address two of them. First of all is overarching strategy number one. I recommend that you look at more holistic outcomes and metrics than those that are currently reflected in the materials I found online. Portrait of a graduate described a young adult with academic, work, social, and life skills to be productive, citizen of our diverse world. Yet all the current metrics are based on limited academic outcomes, AP, IB test scores, SOL score rates, graduation rates. This leaves out a significant number of children with disabilities who don't even take any of those tests. Where are their metrics, right? This is in direct contrast to the holistic education required by Portrait of a Graduate. A high school diploma used to mean that a student was ready to be a productive member of society. Now we have so many academic requirements and academic only measures that a high school diploma means college readiness and nothing else, which is in direct contrast to portrait of a graduate. Left behind are the students from whom multiple choice tests are not the best way to measure comprehension. Left behind are the electricians, the auto mechanics, the artists, the musicians like my son come by the special ed conference he'll be playing. Left behind are him. Let me give you an example. He was one of only two seventh graders and one of the six only ever in 20 years to perform, seventh graders in the advanced guitar ensemble to perform at Unplugged at Lake Braddock. By musician standard, he's excelling. He's yet to pass an SOL. By your standards, he's failing. That's wrong. This focus on academic testing also discourages inclusive opportunities and forces students with disabilities to give up general education electives, which I had to fight very hard for my son, for remedial academic and organizational skills and segregated class settings in order to improve test scores only. Conversely, children with behavioral issues are not receiving appropriate support in general education settings and are removed to the detriment of their abilities to, to access higher level academics. Studies show that education in inclusive settings improves academic, behavioral, social, and post-secondary outcomes for children with disabilities and improves outcomes for those without. And how are we supposed to educate portraits of a graduate to work and live in a diverse world if they're never exposed to children with disabilities, including the one in 68 children who have autism? If they're not included from a young age in school, trust me, they will not get included in society. 80% of kids with autism, adults with autism, are unemployed nationwide. The average salary is $8.10 an hour. It is not lack of job skills. It is lack of acceptance. And this academic only focus, the student success focus that we have, is the biggest impediment to post-secondary outcomes. So I ask, when you're looking at outcomes for kids with disabilities, please don't just look at test scores. Look at actual outcomes. Are they productive citizens of our society? And are our other children actually productive citizens of our society in a 21st century diverse world? Please take a look at that. Thank you. Appreciate your time. 
Thank you for looking at the picture. Thank you. The next speaker is Barbara Gehar. <clears throat> Good evening, school board members and Dr. Braban. I'm here tonight representing my children who attended international schools, as well as Rolling Valley Elementary School, Key Middle School, and now Lee High School. Currently, I also volunteer at the Lee High School College and Career Center. <clears throat> I'm here to raise concerns regarding the possible boundary change directly affecting the Rolling Valley families within the Lee High School pyramid. Lifelong learning is critical, and the staff at Robert E. Lee regularly teach, mentor, coach, tutor, and support students to highlight this value. They are directly attributed with Springfield's future success. We use our education as a foundation to understand today's culturally diverse world. Lee High School has a diverse population, and it acts as a launch pad for my children to reach success at the University of Virginia and in another year, another post-secondary institution. However, the impact that these adults make decreases with lower enrollment, causing great concern if the boundary change moves forward. Lee High School is currently under-enrolled even with the current renovations complete, uh, um, when it is completed, West Springfield High School is projected to be over enrollment capacity, creating greater issues. How will the overcrowded classes be dealt with? Will, the order, will you order more trailers, making West Springfield High School again an even softer security target? Removing more students from the already under-enrolled Lee High School directly causes a drop in academic course selection and performance in its athletic arenas. After listening to many college representatives who visit our school, I've learned that college admission depends highly on which courses students take based on those offered and the grades earned in each class. I've also learned that athletic scholarships depend upon the competitiveness of the school's programs. How do you propose keeping Lee High School competitive on all sides while promising its students equal opportunity at post-secondary institutions? I argue that maintaining or even increasing enrollment at Lee High School will improve its already challenging IB curriculum and the existing athletic programs. While my husband and I have prioritized offering our children opportunities to grow in resilience, I'm concerned about how current Rolling Valley Elementary School families will emphasize this characteristic if it is no longer a split feeder school. College professors and representatives are publishing the need for high school graduates to have regularly taken age-appropriate risks, made mistakes, be held accountable, and of course, appreciate that resilience requires all three of these experiences. Continuing to expect middle schoolers to explore connecting with others grows resilience and thereby, thereby preparing them for life after high school. Many parents and staff are working very hard to ensure Lee High School students and graduates successfully navigate today's society in their chosen careers. Let's appreciate their efforts by improving the opportunities for all of the student body. Thank you for your time and attention to this crucial matter. Our children's future and that of the larger Springfield community lie with you. Thank you. The next speaker is George Becerra. Good evening, Dr. Rayban, Chairman Strauss, and school board members. I'm here to also talk about uh, goal number one under the strategic plan for student success. Uh, I'd like to thank Dr. Presidio for his uh, lengthy uh, summary presentation that you will, uh, somebody present tonight, and then on Monday's work session, he'll go more detail. Uh, a couple points I wanted to point out about, uh, about the plan, about the report that's done every year before it used to be presented in December, now it's in April. Uh, first is, I appreciate the report, but again, it does not mention performance targets 
when will they be eliminated, the gaps? But I think that's going to be an issue you guys will be tackling next. But I want to say it again. It's great to have this, but if you really mean what you want to do, you're going to say by a certain time frame. If you're talking about achievement gaps, let's say 2021, 22 in different areas, but the constituents know that this is what the goal for the board will be and not just lip service. Second is on, on the presentation side, slide number 28. Uh, talks about uh, student access to technology at home. Uh, from my understanding, I've heard over the years, I've always heard 90 plus percent of access. But when you look at this, it looks like 21% of the folks are not responding or, or declined the survey. So I think that needs to be reworded. And it's not really 90% of the people or, or students receiving home uh, internet at home. Uh, you just need to improve that. Uh, second is, um, is, or the third, my fault, is the closing achievement gap metrics. Uh, will these be aligned to the new state accreditation markers? I think we need to align everything instead of going in silos. And when I'm also talking about that, is when you guys represent every two years your district plan to the state, those goals should rely to your superintendent valuation, to your regional assistant and superintendent evaluations, to your principal valuation, then to your school improvement plan. Because all those metrics have to align. If not, we're broken in certain areas. So let's make sure we're doing work and we're not breaking up the uh, things we don't need to be. Uh, the last thing is the most probably important thing I came here to talk about. Uh, again, I appreciate Dr. Bra uh, Dr. Brabrand, Dr. Presidio, and Dr. Duran for, the, for this report on Monday. But I would love to have the information by district. I know you guys do it by region, but I th think in terms of accountability for your constituents, they would like to know the data by district. How is their school board member doing every four years, eight years, how many years you've been here? They would like to know. Because all you do is aggregate subgroups. Yes, that's an improvement. Over the years, we didn't have subgroups. So I appreciate that. But now, year by year, you have 13 through 17 presented. We need to know by districts. And then an educated parent can go to their board of supervisor. They can say, this is why we need money. This is how it's affecting lead district, Hunter Mill, Braddock, Mason. This is where our kids are maybe not performing as well. I also like to suggest for future budget meetings, I know you guys love to have them with your constituents, but relate it to the individual person in that district, break out ideas that affects their district. County Executive Hill said he is gonna to try to do that next year, so when they come to their budget meetings for the county, uh, for the Board of Supervisors, those constituents will relate instead of billions of dollars or this and that. So I'd like to thank again Dr. Presidio, Dr. Brayman, Dr. Duran for the presentation they have Monday and also an open conversation about closing these achievement gaps by a certain time frame. Thank you. Thank you. Our last speaker this evening is Ann Brooks Kenny. Hi. Um, my name is Annie, not Ann. <laughs> Sorry, it's, um, so I have a daughter and she's on the autism spectrum. I thought it would be a good idea to come in April. Um, I don't know if you guys are familiar with my friend Charlotte who's been here a couple of times talking about school security. Um, that's a really big concern for me. My daughter's school has had one lockdown drill this whole year and that's it. And besides that, she's in a non-category classroom and a lot of her classmates have um, auditory STEM issues they can't control it. So in a lockdown situation, what's her classroom supposed to do? Because silence isn't an option. Someone's gonna make a sound, so there needs to be more done. And I keep hearing you guys are working on it and working on it and working on it. It's been almost 20 years that we've had since the first school shooting. It took six months for my school which was a private school after 9-11 and the DC sniper to have double door entry. So the only way you could get into that school would be to show your identification or you couldn't access the students. My, I've seen schools where you can just walk in. You get buzzed in, you don't have to go in the office and that's a problem for me because not only in the extreme situation of a school shooter, but just people wandering into my kid's school. Um, I don't have all the solutions, but I would really like to hear sooner rather than later what you guys think or what you're willing to do. Um, and second to that, um, I'm just really concerned that you guys don't pay enough of attention. There's a lot of UIC listening and it's been frustrating for me 
because I see people looking down at their phones or computers, and I understand there's a difference between notes and all that, but people come up here to talk to you guys with their issues, and I think it would be really helpful if you had a town hall aspect so we don't just feel like we're talking into blank space, because um, that's kind of what it seems like a lot of people go through. Um, and I think you guys are public servants and your job is to listen to us. And I honestly didn't come up with much because I didn't know if I was gonna have anyone's attention. And I feel like I do now. Um, so I'd just really like to close with, I just found out about the special education um, uh, group. Love to join them, see what they're gonna do because I, like most parents, have had a lot of problems dealing with the IEP system. I didn't go to public school. It's all brand new to me. So um, that's pretty much it. I guess I have 30 seconds left. So yeah, thanks. Great. Well, the SEPTA people are here. You can join up. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next is student representative matters. I call on Ms. Fetaconda. Thank you, Madam Chair. So I'd first like to start out with recognizing our Boy Scout troop in the audience, Troop 702, who is working on their citizenship in the community badge. If all of you could stand to be recognized. I'm very glad they all have the opportunity to come in and get, see our town halls and engage with our speakers. So that's an incredible opportunity that you guys are all working on. Uh, you guys can sit down now. So what we had this Monday was our election of the next student representative elect. I'm actually kind of surprised that the year is almost at an end, but the Student Advisory Council elected Benjamin Tigner from South Lakes High School as the student representative elect for next year. I'm really looking forward with working with Benny so that he's ready to uh, assume the role in July. Both of us have a shared interest in making sure that we are making access to academic and extracurricular opportunities more equitable from the moment students enter kindergarten to when seniors are deciding their postgraduate plans. And among many other issues, including school safety, student workload, project-based learning, and expanding students' abilities to provide feedback on their education and really work with their school administrations. So for the next few months, I'm really excited to work with Benjamin to ensure that the transition is as smooth as possible so that our students continue to have a two-way flow of information between the student body and the school board. Thank you. Thank you. We are very excited about uh, the prospect of, a, of another new student, He's Ms. Here. Hines. He's here. Where is Ben? Oh, there he yeah. is. Yeah, well, please. congratulations and yeah. welcome. Stand be recognized. All right. And, you know, go Seahawks. I think this is the first time. All right. <laughs> Wonderful. So it's always nice because there will be an overlap. And so Ms. Fetaconda can, can help um, Benjamin get acclimated and understand the workload. <laughs> Thank you and congratulations. Now uh, we have come to the presentation of the, our strategic plan goal one, student success. And I call on Dr. Braybram for the introduction. Thank you, Chairman Strauss. As you know, goal one, student success, is the culmination, uh, this report is the culmination of our number one priority in Fairfax County Public Schools. This report's full of very valuable information and we're going to summarize the report here tonight and we will go into it in more depth at our work session as we have been doing with other presentations to the board. This report is a cross-departmental collaboration. It required a lot of work and a lot of work is required because student success is the foundation, the first block of our strategic plan, Ignite. So I wanna thank the team, our team, your team, my team, our team together for all the hard work on preparing this report. In particular, I wanna thank our Chief Academic and Equity Officer, Dr. Duran, for his leadership. And I'd also uh, like to thank the Assistant Superintendent for Instructional Services, <laughs> Dr. Presidio, who's going to do the presentation tonight. And he's very excited to be here and take the lead in sharing. Now, Francisco's out here and I'm out here. We might add in a word or two, um, but uh, I'm just really proud of the work that they've been doing. We got to uh, talk about this in leadership team and see it. And I think you're gonna be very excited and proud of the work. We've got a lot of glows. We've still got some areas that we acknowledge are grows, things that we can still do better. And we look forward to the presentation tonight, the conversation and work session to continue to drive and improve our strategic plan and ultimately outcomes for kids so that every student has 
success in Fairfax County Public Schools. So Dr. Presidio. I'm oh. sorry, I just wanna say something really quick to the audience. I'm, Dr. Brabrand was getting to um, acknowledge Sloan Presidio and I just kept going, Sloan, Sloan, Sloan. So I made him laugh. So the only reason he laughed is because <laughs> he was already doing something that I was prompting him to do. <laughs> I like the informal tone we're setting already, so that's very good. Yeah, I appreciate very good. that. Thank you, Dr. Brabrand. Thank You're you, uh, Chairman Strauss, uh, and all the school board members. It's a pleasure to be here this evening, have the opportunity to present this year's uh, report on goal one of the strategic plan, student success. I do need to uh, apologize to you in advance, though, as we start to take a look at this report for the length of the report. It is 150 pages long, the narrative report. Uh, we've got 45 slides that we're gonna review at the work session on Monday. You know, but uh, as Mark Twain famously said, if I had more time, I would have written less. Um, so we're really trying to streamline as much as we can. And, and it really, I think, on that point is, is really important, um, the work that the board is doing right now to streamline the strategic plan. And I just want to thank you for your leadership on that. The work that you're doing is, I think, really going to bring strategic focus to the division's continuous improvement efforts. And I think it's really going to show an impact um, in our student performance in the years to come. So thank you for that work that you're doing. Um, in that same vein, uh, I'm not going to try to pr provide information on all 150 pages tonight. Um, what I'm going to do instead is give a high-level summary uh, of some of the major successes and some of the major challenges facing uh, the school system with regard to student achievement. And I, I want to also, though, recognize that we have a put together a new format in the report this year. So we've organized the report around the four associated strategies in goal one. Um, in the report, there's a chapter for each strategy that provides an introduction and some context uh, to that particular strategy. And then it provides information associated with the associated desired outcomes and the information on the associated performance metrics. And the reason that I, I mentioned the report format is that we would never expect anybody in the community to actually read a 150-page report. We wouldn't really even expect board members to be able to read a 150-page report. But the way that we've organized the information, we think it's going to be more helpful for board members and community members to locate the information that you're most interested in. Might be early childhood, might be reading achievement, um, whatever the case may be. So I think the report is going to help in that regard. And I would also thank the board for really kind of pushing us in the direction to provide more context and put the data um, and the analysis in context. And certainly Ms. McLaughlin and uh, Ms. Schultz had really been big advocates of that last year. So hopefully in the, the new report format uh, will be helpful. And we've also produced a video to kind of kick off the report this evening that highlights some of the successes that we see across the school system in relation to all of the desired outcome areas in the uh, strategic plan. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at a brief video and then we'll come back and I'll have more information on this year's report. You can use that in life, you know, anywhere. I just love being in a global classroom because because if we're researching about about a certain place that some people in the global classroom are from, they can confirm. They can just revise and help you out with their information since they know a lot about what you're researching. Talking to someone across the country, another school across the country, that's pretty big. But talking to someone in a different country, that's huge. You're communicating with people in Costa Rica and that's something that's new and exciting. We get to basically take control of our own learning by doing projects like Capstone for juniors and stuff like that. POLs basically, it's all looking into yourself and how you learn and you're basically trying to find out ways of helping you retain your own information and creating something and producing something you care about and you're passionate about. It's like my dream. I, I, I get a little emotional about it because I just, 
I really, I'm really passionate about the cello and stuff, so it just, the MIP thing like is really like kind of like changed my life. In using the universal screening tool this year, we have gathered some um, helpful assessment information that in part has given us more time back for teachers with instruction and help them to plan targeted uh, intervention for our students who need some help. What do you want to be when you grow up? A teacher. A teacher just like me? We are here to support students from the time they first enter our buildings to the time that they walk across the stage at graduation. Our twins are four years old when they entered the Head Start program at Fairfax County. And when the girls started, they had two phenomenal teachers that came out to the house to evaluate them early on and see how they were doing and really get to know them a little bit more before they started school. Over the course of the year, the twins did really well. Um, they came home really excited about their teachers and making new friends. At the end of the program, they came out to the house, re-evaluated them and um, said that they were ready for kindergarten. They were well prepared um, with their education as well as socialization. These are kind of the mice, rats, snakes, we'll keep those all together. We'll keep birds in there. Fairfax County have these awesome opportunities for the students to further their education and um, you know the transition services and employability skills. It's a great learning experience. I think a day like today shows her what she can do as a career in the future. She loves to work with animals, it's always been her goal, but we didn't know what that would look like long term. So, uh, you know, the idea that there are jobs out there that she could do with animals is wonderful. It just really lends itself to preparing our students to be um, career ready. Yes, success! It's an inch by six, maybe six and maybe. If I know why I'm doing the math, then it's a lot easier for me to like say, okay, I, I'm going to need this in the real world. So it's, it's a lot easier for me to like pay attention. Taking this class made me realize that you can take your passion and turn it into a career. All right, well, thank you. I, hopefully you see from that video, there's a lot of great things that are happening in our schools related to the uh, division strategic plan. Everything that was highlighted is related to a desired outcome and goal one. So our schools are really doing a lot of great work. So next what I'd like to do is call your attention to the summary that's posted on board docs. And we're just gonna give really a high level overview of some of the major successes and challenges uh, in the school system. And I'd like to start with this infographic that really highlights some of the great things that are happening in our system. And you can see that overall our data really indicate that we've had growth trends on most of our performance measures over the last several years. And you can see also from this infographic that we continue to outperform um, the nation and we really continue to outperform even a lot of countries on international assessments. So we're, we're doing quite well when you look at measures like the SAT, ACT, and PISA. Um, we've got a 91% on-time graduation rate. And one of the things that we're really proud about is the growth that our English language learners are making. You can see from the infographic the really dramatic increase in the number of credits that our high school English language learners um, are, have been able to accumulate over the last several years. And I think we've got a lot to really be proud about um, when we look at our school system as a whole. But of course, we also have a lot of challenges that we need to address as well. So when we talk about the challenges facing the system, we're talking about one of the major challenges are some of the gaps that we see in opportunity and access and achievement across our system. And I'd like to talk first about opportunity gaps briefly. So when we talk about opportunity gaps, we're really talking about disparities in the available resources or opportunities uh, to students. So you might think about considering whether a certain opportunity exists for all students. Um, for example, is a particular program available in all schools for students to be able to um, access equitably? And really one of the biggest opportunity gaps that we have in Fairfax County is in relationship to access to high quality uh, preschool education. So this particular chart, um, which we have a lot more detail in the full report and a lot more analysis, but this particular chart or heat map really uh, shows the percentages of students that are entering kindergarten in FCPS that did not participate in preschool. So you can see from the chart where in the county, the specific locations where we have the largest percentages of students um, that are entering kindergarten without a preschool experience. So in many areas, many places in the county, more than a third of our students are entering kindergarten without having access to high quality preschool education. Now we've made a, 
significant amount of progress over the last several years. We've added an additional 750 seat spaces for students um, to attend preschool, um, but obviously we have a long ways to go in terms of closing this particular opportunity gap. The next gap that I'd like to talk about is related to access. And when we talk about access gaps in Fairfax, we're really talking about access where we have disparities in terms of who's utilizing an available resource. So you might think about is, you know, is every student in a school able to access a program that is in a particular school? So for example, are all students able to access advanced math coursework or AP and IB courses um, in equitable rates in ways? But the access gap that I'd like to highlight here as we're scrolling down is the access to technology. Um, and one of our speakers this evening spoke to this a little bit. And when you look at the chart that you see here, you see that in the fall of 2017, uh, many of our families indicated that they don't have adequate computer access or adequate internet access at home. And really, we believe very strongly in 2018 that access to learning technology, technology as a learning tool, is fundamental if we're gonna produce equitable student learning outcomes. So we'll dig into this data and talk about it in a little bit more detail during Monday's work session as well. Um, but FCPS on, of course, is one of the division's initiatives where we're really trying to address this particular access gap and make sure that all of our students have access to technology to learn regardless of the time or the place um, or the pace of student learning. The last gap, that you're very familiar with, I think. We've continued to talk about our achievement gaps in this year's report. And when you look at our overall achievement, um, our trends look really positive. Um, you see positive trends in all of our subgroups. And um, if we scroll down just a little bit more, we might be able to get both of these infographics on the same page at the same time. Um, but you see positive trends over this five-year period of time um, on all of our subgroup performance in this particular chart is looking at our reading performance overall, so the division's average reading performance. Um, but when you look a little bit more closely, uh, you notice that we continue to have large achievement gaps across some of our subgroups. So when you look at the difference between our white and, uh, and Asian student performance uh, and our black and ha Hispanic student performance, you do notice that we have about 20 percentage point gaps in that area. When you look at economically disadvantaged, English language learners, and students with disabilities, uh, we also have large gaps that we need to overcome. So some of the things that we're doing uh, to, to address some of those gaps, one of the things was the universal screener that was highlighted in the, in the video, and you heard one of our principals talking about how that tool has been able to help us identify students earlier that might have reading gaps, particularly um, early indicators of dyslexia, and how we've been able to target um, additional instructional time and supports and services for those students. So we're in just year two of our implementation of the universal screener, and we're seeing very positive results and trends. We're also working very closely with our school-based leaders, our principals, our assistant principals, and the instructional leaders in our schools to make sure that we can fully implement in all of our schools our updated and enhanced reading curriculum, which has undergone significant revisions, really a complete rewrite over the last two years. And we worked very closely with um, some consultants to make sure that we had re research-based, evidence-based best practices materials, resources, and training opportunities for all of our teachers to be able to implement those materials with fidelity, and we continue to work on that. Additionally, we've created new program standards for English language development. Um, we have about 30% of our students in Fairfax County are English language learners, and our students, after they develop English proficiency, actually do very well in our standardized assessments. We've talked about that in the past. Oftentimes, former English language learners actually outperform native English speakers on our standardized tests, but we need to get them to that point of proficiency. And our new uh, English learner program standards are really about how to accelerate students' English proficiency with direct support around their language development needs. In another big area where we're working uh, very collaboratively with the Department of Student Services is to make sure that all of our teachers in our schools understand how to support and improve instruction for students with disabilities. So the final area of achievement data that I'd like to share with you this evening um, is in regards to math. So when we look at this infographic, again, these are our aggregate math scores across the division. And similar to our English and our reading scores, you see that the trends are positive for all of our subgroups. 
over this five-year period of time. And again, in the report and in the appendix of the report, we break down year-by-year -year performance and we analyze the trends from year to year. And you're going to see slight increases and slight dips in some, um, in some subgroups and some measures in some years. But overall, the, the, the trends are positive in all of our subgroups in mathematics as well. Um, but again, like we saw in reading, we continue to have persistent achievement gaps for some of our student subgroups. So some of the focus areas that we're working on, you know that we're in the process of adopting new resources and new materials um, for mathematics in elementary, middle, and some of our high school classes this year. We're working very hard to strengthen our participation for historically underrepresented student populations, both in advanced math coursework at the elementary school level and in Algebra I in middle school. And we're continuing to support um, our content teachers in terms of their, their work with students with disabilities. So that really does conclude my high-level presentation for this evening. We're going to have a lot of time to dig in during Monday's school board work session. Um, I want to thank our two meeting managers, Mr. Wilson and Ms. Uh, McLaughlin, for their help in preparing, not just for this evening, but for Monday's work session. Uh, and I think we'll have a great discussion. But I would be happy at this time if there are any uh, questions to entertain a few questions this evening as well. Thank you very much, Dr. Presidio. And again, we will have an extended uh, period of time on Monday to discuss this. So if there are clarifying questions, so we're happy to ask those. Uh, Mrs. Schultz. Oop. Hi, Dr. Presidio. How are you? Very good. Thank you. I'm not going to comment on the video. Okay. We did reuse footage that we had shot before. So. I'm not going to comment on the video. <laughs> so um, I will, however, comment on that heat map. I think I have been asking for that heat map for five and a half years. I am so excited about that heat map. Great. That is, and I went to a breakout session um, specifically on um, content and data visualization um, uh, at the National School Board Association uh, conference that we just went to. And that is precisely what the staff was presenting about the difference between a data table and a visual graphic and how presenting information in a meaningful way helps board members make better policy. So thank you, thank you, thank you for that. Um, the very last thing you said was talking about um, um, advanced math and underrepresented populations. How are boys doing in advanced math um, enrollment? Do you know? So I don't, I don't want to misquote any data on that. That's information that I could bring to Monday's work session if you'd like to dig into that a little bit more. I'd be happy to do that. I will be interested because um, some pretty disturbing statistics are starting to come out about, you know, we talk about advancing girls in STEM all the time. And the reality is it's actually the boys that are falling behind. And so I will be interested in the work session and talking about um, how boys are represented in um, some of the advanced uh, academics and, and math categories. And whether or not we've done a wonderful job also with this visual graphic of disaggregating data in a much more meaningful way. Um, but um, disaggregating it by, um, by, by boys gym. and girls and how, and how they're performing. Um, will be helpful in going forward. It may not be ready for the work session, but I'll be interested in that going forward. Yeah, Thank we'd, you. we'd be happy to do that. One of the things that um, we discussed in our meeting manager conversation the other day, too, is there might be some things that the board is interested in really going in depth on. And again, we'd be happy to prepare more information, uh, meet with individual board members, do additional work sessions to do some deep dives on some topics like that. Thank you, Dr. Presidio. And I'll also add, as we roll out our equity dashboard that we talked about, we are including gender so that we can begin to disaggregate boys and girls and, and male and female. And that was a request we got from our previous equity conversation. So you'll begin to see that as well in the equity dashboard. Ms. McLaughlin? Yes, as uh, one of the two meeting managers, I did want to just uh, let the board know I'm going to send an email because I think sometimes it's easier to see it in writing than to talk about it right now. But just some kind of prep uh, work for you all to think about because it is 150 pages. Um, but I think if you can look at the PowerPoint slide first, that might then help you then go to the report. Um, but one of the things we discovered is last year, we did this goal one report in two work sessions. 
Now we're cramming this back into one work session. So one of the things we were going to bring to you as meeting managers is that we do have a second follow-up work session, but it would be where the board has some consensus about the areas we'd like a little deeper um, discussion because it is a very comprehensive report. Uh, but I, I do believe it's important that we don't shortchange this. And given last year we gave more time to the goal one report, I'd like to make sure we as a board at least talk about that and, and maybe get a chance to kind of hone in on there. Um, and then the second thing is I want to say that I really appreciated um, Dr. Presidio has some additional data points to bring on Monday, and it has to do with looking at um, our poverty rates among our subgroups, because uh, it's really remarkable when you look at the poverty rates among our subgroups, you start to almost see um, some more clarity about why we're seeing achievement gaps as well, because we do know that poverty plays an important role, and the poverty rates are really dramatic among the different subgroups. And so it's just, it's another piece that we have to be kind of helping putting some data in context. So, um, you know, I really do appreciate Dr. Presidio. The other thing is, as you're reading this report and preparing for Monday's work session, please do make some notes to yourself about where you're gonna wanna find the board spending a little more time on it. And then also be prepared that we decide the only way we'll get through this is, he's gonna go through the whole presentation. So if you need to make lots and lots of notes on the questions you're gonna to wanna to ask, we are not taking any questions till he's done. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Moon. Thank you for the presentation. And I'm gonna be um, emailing to you uh, some of the specific questions, but thank you for mentioning uh, about the poverty rate among different subgroups because there was going to be one of my requests and question to you but in addition to poverty rate, if we could also bring in a percentage of English language learners among different subgroups, as well as uh, special education, because all those things have a uh, tremendous impact on student achievement, because we'll be, and hopefully we'll be spending some time on looking at the achievement gap, how to address those, but at the same time, I mean, we need to know the data first and, and, and be able to really understand what is uh, uh, resulting in those achievement gap and what to do with those. So I'll be sending you again my specific questions, including your definition of our FCPS definition of English language learners versus ESOL students, there may be a differences because I see different percentage and different numbers. Right. I'm going to th thank you. Yep. Thank you. Mr. McElveen. Thank you, Sloan, for the presentation and thank you for the, the graphics, which I, and I will agree with my colleagues that um, these are very powerful and the, the heat map on pre-K, um, I'm going to frame it and put it on my wall because that's something that um, I need to look at every day. I think all of us need to look at every day um, just to remind ourselves where the real work needs to be done. Uh, the, the one statistic that um, didn't really come out in your presentation tonight, but I do want to have more conversation about on Monday, uh, is that uh, by literacy graduation seal. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that it's only 25% of our students is troubling. Um, my colleagues will know that back in 2006, um, this board adopted student achievement goals. And one of, those, uh, one of the things subsumed under that at the time was the goal of ensuring that all of our students graduate fluent or at least proficient in at least two languages. And the fact that we are still at 25% um, is a major issue. Now, and on slide 45, you do present um, the trends showing up, going upward um, in that area, but I will tell you that over the past um, decade or so, um, the school district has really flatlined in this area. And when we talk about equity, um, which um, your presentation rightly focuses on, this is an area where there is not equitable access to programs, and there has not been for, for a long, long time. And so um, I'm hopeful that um, Dr. Brabrand's superintendency will not um, ignore this issue as it has been ignored in the past, and that we will make progress. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Hines? Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to ask kind of a big picture question mm -hmm. that came up tonight, some of our speakers, and it comes up from time to time. Um, 
And uh, it, it's probably not something we can answer tonight, but the question of whether, particularly for our students with disabilities, you know, I, we don't want to ever lose the focus on academic achievement in, in this community. And I don't think anyone was suggesting that we should. Um, but to broaden what we look for uh, in a more holistic way, I think that's the, that's the suggestion. If we can find other ways to measure other kinds of success. And um, it's, an, it's a conversation we as a board and everyone has had over the years, how you know, the accountability measures are not necessarily always the things we actually want to teach and measure. So um, not looking for any specifics, but um, how would you respond to that? And what do you think um, the board should be asking for in that area? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. Um, we definitely can spend more time on that on Monday. Right now, I would say we have, um, in our strategic plan, desired outcomes related to creating a balanced approach to assessment or a balanced assessment framework. And we've actually been making growth and progress um, in FCPS in that regard. And I think we're even pushing kind of state policy in the state of Virginia in that regard. One of the things that we've been doing is we've been leading what's referred to as a networked improvement community, which is essentially just a group of 11 school systems in the state of Virginia that are working on trying to get more performance-based tasks into the assessment landscape, not just for internal purposes, but for external accountability as well. And as a result of that work, we saw the state give us policy flexibility to remove a number of SOLs in terms of assessing that content and those standards with multiple choice assessments and allowed us to use performance-based tasks. The work that this board did and this community did around portrait of a graduate, we've seen the state adopt a profile of a graduate. So now our work is just to continue to kind of push that agenda and push the envelope and to be able to demonstrate that we can reliably and validly measure the same content skills um, that you can measure on a standardized multiple choice assessment. And we've got a lot of folks in this division that are already doing that and doing that well. One of the slides that I'll present on Monday talks about that work and the work that we're doing in our capstone experiences. A few of those things were highlighted in the video tonight with some of the students talking about their capstone experiences. So we'd be happy to talk to, uh, about that in a lot more detail. Ms. Corbett Sanders. Dr. Presidio, thank you. I think this is an excellent presentation and I really look forward to Monday's uh, discussion. One of the things that when I was a kid, we used to have these great um, books where, uh, and I think it was mostly for girls, where you would have like a, a picture of a kid, of a child or of a um, woman, and then you would overlay clothing on and you'd overlay first the dress and then a hat and things like that. And so your hot map, is really important when I see um, the heat map for pre-K. And as you know, this is an area that I have been very concerned about in my community for a long time. And we have increased. We've had some success. And we know that we'll be getting even more slots in the future. But I think what would be helpful, in the same way that you have this heat map and you have the various types of pre-K experiences laid out on here. I also think we should be laying over that same heat map our Title I schools and our poverty numbers. because, And then we should be laying over um, that heat map our, um, our uh, diversity numbers. And so that will allow us to, and our number of children that um, are ESOL, or new English language learners. And um, you know, you don't have to put it all on one map at the same time, because that makes it impossible to actually do the analysis. But I think it would be helpful to be able to pull up one and put down another so that we can really drill down on solutions that can address some of these concerns. Um, so if, if you yeah, can think ab about that a bit, I'd appreciate absolutely. it. Absolutely, and we'd be happy to dig into that on Monday. We have some charts, I think, already that we could show, and then maybe some additional ones that we would need to produce. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much, Dr. Presidio. So seeing right, no further questions, we will look forward to a long discussion on Monday. All right, thank you all. Thank you very much. Um, colleagues, I think we will not do our confirmation of action taking a closed meeting until we finish our work at the end, because we will go back into our closed session after this meeting. OK, so we do it all at once. The next agenda item is a consent agenda. 
Our adopted rules of parliamentary procedure, Robert's rules provide for a consent agenda, listing several items for approval of the board by a single motion. Many items listed have gone through board review and documentation has been provided to all board members and the public in advance. Items may be removed from the consent agenda at the request of any board member prior to the meeting. 6.01, approve the minutes of March 22nd, 2018 regular school board meeting. 6.02, award the contract for the running track replacement at Falls Church High School to Field Turf USA Inc. in the amount of $382,147.50 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.03, award a contract for the Oakton High School renovation project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Henley Construction Company, Inc., in the amount of $89,775,000 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.04, award a contract for the Marshall High School Synthetic Turf Field Replacement Project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, GTR Turf Inc., in the amount of $736,350.42, and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.05, award a contract for the Hutchison Elementary School Synthetic Turf Field Replacement Project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, GTR Turf Inc. in the amount of $423,987.93 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.06, .06, award the contract for the chiller replacement at Mount Vernon High School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Stingray Welding, LLC, and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.07, award the contract for the chiller replacement at Franklin Middle School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Edward Kakarian and Company, Inc., and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.08, award the contract for the boiler replacement at Bryant Alternative High School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, Capital Boiler Works, Inc., in the amount of $495,043 and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 6.09, appoint individuals to serve on committees as detailed in the agenda item. Is there any objection to approving the consent agenda? Hearing and seeing no objection, the consent agenda is approved. Next is new business. The following are new business agenda items. There will not be a vote tonight on these items, but action is scheduled at a future meeting. 7.01, award the contract for the boiler replacement at Luther Jackson Middle School to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 7.02, approve the 2018-2019 local special education annual plan, section 611, part B grant funding application and Section 619, Part B, Preschool Grant Funding Application, as detailed in the agenda item. 7.03, award a contract for the Mount Vernon Woods Elementary School Renovation Project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder, and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 7.04, award a contract for the Bryant Alternative High School Synthetic Turf Field Replacement Project to the lowest responsive and responsible bidder and authorize the division superintendent or the assistant superintendent of facilities and transportation services to execute, deliver, and administer the contract on behalf of the school board. 
7.05, approve the strategic plan goal one, student success report, as detailed in the agenda item. Next is Superintendent Matters. Dr. Braybrand. Thank you, Chairman Strauss. I want to share some kudos for some of our team here in FCPS. We have received a Certificate of Achievement for Excellence in Financial Reporting for a comprehensive annual financial report from the Government Finance Officers Association, GFOA. The award is the highest form of recognition in the area of governmental accounting and financial reporting, and it's conferred to school systems that demonstrate a constructive spirit of full disclosure to clearly communicate their financial stories. You know, transparency is one of the things that's very important to me um, in leadership, and I'm really proud of our finance folks for getting this award. I, I think it's something that they've received, Ms. Burden, for several years, and uh, I am really just proud of having a consistent legacy of excellence around this kind of financial reporting here in Fairfax County Public Schools. It's very important. So thank you, Lee, and thank your team for all their work. I also want you to know for the second consecutive year, FCPS has been named a 2018 Energy Star Partner of the Year. Um, and this Energy Management Award winner award goes for our efforts to improve energy efficiency in our buildings and facilities. The district's accomplishments will actually be recognized by the EPA and the U.S. Department of Energy uh, at a ceremony in Washington, D.C. on April 20th. We earned the EPA's Energy Star Certification in 2015, and we have the most schools meeting those standards of any school division in the country. The district has a long-standing partnership with the EPA that combines principal engagement, energy saving practices, and the use of Energy Star equipment, certified equipment to save energy and protect the environment. And this year we were recognized for finding even new ways to uh, save energy and promote success. We saved more than $5 million, $5 million in energy costs in 2017 through such a comprehensive energy program. Finally, I want you to know the third quarter ends tomorrow. So next week is the beginning of the final stretch, fourth quarter. I've been talking to all of our principal associations this week, and we have reminded them that we want everybody, our students and faculty and all of our employees to finish up strong the school year. Um, this is in some ways uh, one of the most important parts of the year. We wanna create a climate for good instruction. We wanna create a climate for good assessment, whether it's a capstone project or problem-based learning or some of the more traditional standardized assessments or the national assessments that our kids do at the end of the year. Um, I told folks at the very beginning of the year to love kids to love teaching and learning and be professional. And I expect it each and every day, but it's even more so here in fourth quarter where our kids have some of their best highs of the entire school year happen in fourth quarter. For some of our children, it's some of the biggest frustrations. Um, so we're really gonna try to be focused on being there and meeting our kids' needs each and every day through the fourth quarter and uh, looking forward to finishing out the school year. So thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Braybrand. Um, next, we have committee reports, and I call on Ms. Darren at Koufax for an update on the Governance Committee. Our Governance Committee met last week, and we talked about changes in the MSOAC um, committee structure, and we also are trying to nail down a date for the, um, we thought we had one, and then there's been some changes um, for a, a follow-up to our um, retreat. Um, we were hoping to do July. We may not be able to do it then, so it may be either late June or September. But we will keep you updated, and we'll give you another, a, a fuller report um, on these issues next Thursday's work session. Okay. Great. Thank you. Now we have board members, and I will start with Ms. Keith Gamara. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm really happy that we're, first of all, um, honoring the military <laughs> families and the military child and I for one want to thank our families and um, just really proud that we were able to do that today and I also want to congratulate our student representative um, Miss uh, Vaticonda received an acceptance to Duke University today UNC 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 and Duke I'm sorry I got it wrong Fully paid, fully paid. So I think she deserves to be recognized. So congratulations. Um, 
With respect to our week, we've had uh, a busy week. We were obviously all together at the National School Board Association, my first, so I enjoyed that very much uh, with my colleagues and also had an opportunity to uh, attend the Fairfax County Council of PTAs a discussion on safety where our colleague uh, Karen Corbett Sanders was one of the panelists um, and also were uh, had an opportunity to go to Mount Vernon High School where they opened up their new career center quite impressive some of the things that are happening in our schools so I'm looking forward to doing more visits and again congratulations to our youngest colleague mm -hmm. Sterling Koufax Yes, congratulations, Staticana. It's how wonderful for you. I'm so excited for you. Um, I too thoroughly enjoyed my time with my colleagues at the National School Boards Association Conference. Um, for those of you who don't know what that is, it's an annual event where school board members from around the country can meet, share ideas, and learn about best practices in school board governance. And so we were over there over the, a long weekend. Um, thank you all to who came out to the Lee District Budget Town Hall I held with Jeff McKay. Um, thank you too to Lee Burden and her staff for their assistance with this event. I truly appreciated you being there. Um, I had the pleasure of attending rescheduled um, Read Across America events that were snowed out or winded out. I can't remember which one, but um, I was able to read with students at Hyvel Valley in Forestdale, and that is one of the fav my most favorite things that I do on this board, so it was a wonderful opportunity to do that last week. Um, I also want to thank the Fairfax County Council of PTAs for organizing a panel discussion where participants discuss safety at home safety at school and what parents can do to curb gun violence. Um, I, we held from, heard from many participants and there was lots of discussion back and forth. So thank you for organizing that. That was an evening well spent earlier this week. And next week I look forward to meeting with the Edison High School PTSA and um, I will be there with Dr. Brigrand. So thank you. Ms. Schultz? Uh, I first want to give a um, uh, heads up, shout out to uh, Teresa Johnson and all the special education staff. Uh, today, as a parent, I rarely comment on my, you know, my own children, but I went through the IEP process um, update for the first time with the benefit of the universal screener and um, saw very significant salient details um, that benefited and, and actually, I think it sped up the IEP process. So um, I, I was also, I'm also grateful that there, were, there weren't 22 people in the room. So if you found a way to streamline it and save our staff and our buildings time, um, or at least in my own specific building, um, just as a parent, you know, I experienced the benefits of the policy that we've implemented. And, um, and I'm grateful for that. Um, I want to congratulate, I, I don't know if you go by Ben, Benny, Benjamin, but um, I'm sad. I was thrilled to be at the National School Board Association Conference, but it was the first time in years I've missed the SAC election. I, I usually stay for the whole thing, so um, we'll look forward to getting to know you and we'll welcome you um, as the student member of the board. Um, I do want to comment for people who are hearing us talk about the National School Board Association um, just briefly. Um, it sounds like it's a boondoggle. And I will say that uh, I was an early naysayer. I was like, why are these people flying around the country going to a conference? And uh, it is a very valuable um, endeavor to do professional development as a public policy and education policy um, governor of a s school system, especially a large one. We get to take ourselves out of ourselves. Um, and I, I sat with superintendents, um, state uh, school board association executives, uh, school board members, school board chairs from school districts literally around the country in m many different venues. And it really is very beneficial to give us some perspective. There is a Fairfax way of doing things, and um, it's not that it's wrong or right, but to learn and, and glean information from other subject matter experts on many different topics is uh, very, very helpful. Uh, I do want to acknowledge my high schools. I've done two more student town halls, still rises to the top of the very best thing that I do, and um, I look forward to 
potentially Dr. Brabrand staff finding a way to do something similar. Uh, we make policy at children and for children, but not often with children. Um, the opportunity to sit unfettered and have discussions with students and hear their perspective um, is extremely beneficial. Particularly, we had a, a video tonight that um, uh, presented more FCPS on and technology listening to students from a student's perspective about what they think about technology and the use in the classroom is very revealing, just as revealing as it is to go and do professional development um, uh, with colleagues from across the country. So um, I, I look forward to continuing that discussion. I think there is much more discussion to be had, um, but I'm glad for us to get back to uh, the business of the board now that we're back. Ms. Hines? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I attended the Washington Area Boards of Education meeting last night. About three times a year, uh, that group gets together, and it's basically what it sounds like. It's the Washington, D.C. Area Boards of Education. Uh, everybody sends one representative from their board about three times a year to sit and hear um, from some from. Uh, staff at one of the school systems talk about something innovative that they're doing so that everyone, representatives from other boards, can hear that. Um, last night we were in Prince George's County at Oxon Hill uh, High School, which is right near um, National Harbor and all those great restaurants there, and they have this amazing culinary arts program. I know some of our schools do as well, but uh, they did feed us last night, which was, um, was worth driving to Oxon Hill for that. Um, but actually, uh, I have been, I don't know if my colleagues know this, but I have been the chair of WABY for the last two plus years. And last night, the representative from PG County took over as chair, so I'm grateful to him for that. Um, and just for people who don't know, the, the probably the greatest value of the Washington Area Boards of Education is actually that FCPS's finance office every year collects data from all the um, school systems in the area and, and publishes the WABY guide, which basically allows us to do apples to apples comparisons between our school systems in the region um, and all kinds of data. You know, so it's a really um, useful service that actually FCPS provides with data from all the school systems. Um, uh, coming up on Saturday, Reston Founders Day has come around again. Seems like it uh, can't be a year already. I think we're up to, uh, Reston is up to 53 years old or maybe older than that, I've lost track. Um, it's just in every year on Lake Ann, uh, the original Lake Ann, right there at Reston. Um, we celebrate those visionary people who stood at that spot all those years ago and imagined a community like Reston. And that, you know, we have this vibrant, wonderful community now. So I'll be representing the school board there. I want to thank the principals in the, my district, the Hunter Mill District, for taking some time and phone calls with me. I decided to reach out to them and just ask um, for their thoughts and reflections on safety, school safety, because that is an issue right now. As the, I know that um, our wonderful safety and security folks are doing a lot of research and they are updating policy and practice and they're going to get back to the board on that. It's, um, it's an area of concern in the community, although it sounds like from talking to our principals, um, people are calmly going about the day-to-day -day and having faith, and um, there are not major concerns, but it was, it was nice to hear that. It was nice to hear that um, the principals have a, do have a lot of faith in our safety and security people. Um, and uh, so I, I just kind of wanted to get their perspective on it as the board may be looking at some changes and new ideas. Um, Finally, I hope to see um, lots of people at the 13th Annual Special Education Conference on April 21st, that is Saturday after this at Hayfield Secondary School. It is always well attended and well run and definitely worth uh, the morning. Mr. Moon. I'm gonna pass, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Corbett Sanders. Sure. I hope everybody had a great spring break. Um, it's hard to believe that we are now finishing up our third quarter and about to start off on our fourth quarter. So I wish all of our students and families a uh, great weekend where they can re-energize before they are back in the classroom next week. Um, I also wanted to um, urge families and community members to get out and visit our middle and high schools and attend our plays and musicals that are um, widely available in the community and it's a wonderful opportunity to see the great talents of all of our kids. Um, 
wanted to thank Northern Virginia Community College and the Bank of America for their generous support in establishing the new college and career center at Mount Vernon High School uh, that Ms. Keys Gamara uh, mentioned. Uh, we were lucky to have both Ms. Keys Gamara and Mr. Moon there yesterday, and it was a great event to um, celebrate this new um, facility. Also want to thank the folks uh, that put together the Student Environmental Action Showcase uh, at George Mason yesterday. That was a wonderful event to showcase so many of our students as they uh, did recycling and um, environmental projects. Uh, students as young as uh, kindergarten and first grade and all the way through high school. Um, and thank you to the Fairfax County Council of PTAs for their um, organizing the meeting on safety and security earlier this uh, week. Um, look forward to seeing you all next week. Bye. Mr. McElveen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Earlier tonight, I was informed that our um, esteemed superintendent will be coming to, down to uh, DuPont Circle to the greatest think tank in the world um, to speak on April 25th at 1.30. He will be sharing the stage with former Treasury Secretary Robert Rubin, uh, among others. So um, anyone who wants to come down that day, happy to go out to lunch uh, before that. And I know Scott won't eat, but he can watch us eat uh, before his panel. So um, congratulations, Superintendent, on that uh, important invitation. Ms. McLaughlin? Um, I just wanted to, again, um, congratulate Benny um, from South Lakes on his election to next year's uh, school board representative. Uh, as I shared with him uh, a little bit earlier this evening, uh, my son serves as the chair of the Woodson delegation and was sending me text message updates at every round of the votes that started with 30 amazing candidates who wanted to serve in this position. And the fact that uh, the students then had to go through multiple rounds to get to just the one and only, um, it's really quite an achievement, uh, Benny. And we're very excited to see someone from Hunter Mill and one of the high schools we have not seen in a very long time, um, being able to bring your voice uh, to this board, to our superintendent, to our community, it's uh, really going to be an exciting um, coming year for all of us to get to work with you. And uh, as we've told Ms. Vanaconda and, and the students before, um, we are very mindful that school comes first. So you do what you can, um, but make sure you always take care of your health and uh, the things that are most important, uh, especially if um, you'll be heading into your senior year, correct? Yeah. So, and uh, many of us have had our children going through college admissions in the last few years. So any uh, advice you want to glean from any of us, we will gladly share that as well with you in the fall. So uh, welcome, and we're looking forward to working with you. Uh, I just want to also say to my colleagues that it was really nice to spend time with so many of you at uh, the National School Board Conference um, this past weekend in San Antonio, and uh, as as Ms. Schultz said, it's really incredible when we get to go to these sessions and learn what's going on at a national level and to learn about important things like how can we be better with our data or how can we be better in engaging with our communities and how we can uh, look at students um, who come from adverse um, childhood experiences and what does that mean um, for the work that we do in meeting the needs of a whole child. And so there really was such a wealth of information, great uh, public speakers, um, but again, also appreciated the time it gave all of us uh, to um, spend some time together, so. Ms. Evans. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, want to thank everybody who came out for uh, my Mason District Town Hall meeting on the budget and uh, those who uh, came for the tour ahead of time of uh, Bailey's Upper Elementary School. Um, it was great to see so many people come out both for the tour and for the town hall meeting, so I appreciate people taking the time and having the conversation. Um, I was very pleased uh, a week ago to attend the groundbreaking for the Bailey's Crossroads Community Shelter and Supportive Housing as we continue to try to um, 
get as close to zero as we can on homelessness in Fairfax County. This is um, a great effort forward uh, by our county, and I was pleased that Congressman Connolly was there, Congressman Beyer, uh, Chairman Bulova, uh, Supervisor Gross, of course, representing Mason District, and uh, Supervisor Jeff McKay, so uh, as well as many business leaders, uh, nonprofits, and um, community volunteers and supporters. So um, thanks to everyone who uh, worked tirelessly to um, to get that uh, to where it is now. Um, and I this is Shine On Week at Stewart High School. Um, a, a unique um, event and unique week in honor of Casey Shulman, who um, is an alum of uh, Stewart High School, and it is focused on spreading kindness, positivity, and cheer, which is the way Casey was very much. And uh, tomorrow there will be a Spring Fest there, which I'm going to uh, head over to, uh, to help them celebrate uh, the the end of Shine On Week. Um, and. Um, I will uh, see people there tomorrow. And with that, uh, I wish everyone good night. Thank you. Um, I congratulate again our uh, uh, facilities and school system for the Energy Star Award. That is quite outstanding. We, I believe, are uh, the leading Energy Star school in the in school system in the country. So we do good work. And I know we have a lot of interest in, in uh, continuing down that road and becoming as efficient as possible. So. Um, I'm proud of the work that we do. Uh, at uh, the NSBA conference, I spend a lot of time on technology uh, information, legal information, and as some of my colleagues have mentioned, it's a wonderful opportunity to get a sense of public school needs and trends across the nation because we are, we educate public schools, educate over 90% of the children in the country. So we are the foundation for our democracy and economy, I feel strongly. Um, and it was interesting, I met um, a very dedicated school board member from Alaska who represents the schools in the Bering Strait. And uh, as part of her agenda, is to move a village and a school. So, but she is very dedicated to her children and had, had many interesting things to comment about her children and her family. So, um, uh, as a nation, we are very much committed to quality education for every single student. Um, with that, we have to return to our closed meeting. So, I will read the motion. The school board will now make a motion to go into closed meeting to, okay, hold on, because we've finished some of this. To consider, but I have to find the legal piece. I'm not going to read it all. <laughs> Oh, here it is. And to discuss and consider disciplinary matters concerning three students pursuant to section 2.2-37118A2 of the Code of Virginia. That is what remains. Is there a motion moved by Mr. Moon, seconded by Ms. Hines? All those in favor? That motion is unanimous. Thank you very much. So we are enclosed. <laughs>